It is seven. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. It is seven o'clock uh, Central Daylight Time. time. So I'm glad that you changed your clocks last night so you could be with us at the right time. Uh, this is the fourth and final session of this year's winter lecture series. Uh, and the theme, as we know, is Can Democracy Be Saved? The Global Trend Towards Strongman Rule. Uh, my name is Peter Levitoff, and I chair the planning committee for this year's series. And I'm glad to uh, to welcome you and hope that uh, you have uh, either watched live the first three sessions or have been able to watch them uh, in their uh, recorded mode uh, through the Unitarian Church website. Uh, we've uh, to review, we've uh, we've had a session on Hungary and uh, and President uh, Viktor Orban, and then a session on Brazil with former President Jair Bolsonaro. And last week we had uh, Turkey uh, with President uh, Recep Tayyip uh, Erdogan. This is our final session. And uh, as it has been for the past 20 of its 41 years, it's uh, sponsored now by the Social Action Committee of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. It's also brought to you with financial support from Humanities Nebraska and the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. Um, we are going to allow the, uh, the speaker to speak uh, uninterrupted, but you're welcome to put comments and questions in the chat function, and uh, they will be aggregated at the end. Our moderator uh, will read the questions off, and uh, our speaker will be able to respond to them. Uh, if you, if uh, a friend of yours misses this lecture or you have to leave for some reason in the middle, uh, it'll be posted within a week or so on the YouTube channel of the Unitarian Church, where you can find it, youtube.com slash Unitarian Church of Lincoln, all without punctuation. Um, I want to introduce to you now uh, Professor Shedd Sait, uh, who is an emeritus professor of computer science and engineering at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and he will introduce our speaker. Go ahead, Shedd. Thank you, Peter. Um, so, as you heard, our, our speaker today is uh, Professor Ashutosh Vashne, and he will be talking about India and Prime Minister Modi. This lecture comes at a particularly opportune time as India heads to general elections in April and May of this year. These elections will determine the composition of the 45 143 members of the Lok Sabha, the People's House, a majority of whom will elect a prime minister. This is a big topic which can be approached from a variety of angles. When I first approached Professor Washington to speak to us, he asked if the title India's Democratic Backsliding would be appropriate. I don't know if that is still going to be the focus of his talk, but with his strong credentials of scholarship and public engagement on Indian politics, I'm sure we are in for an enlightening talk. After his presentation, I hope our loyal, informed, and highly engaged audience will follow through with the appropriate questions to deepen our understanding of where India is headed. Now to formally introduce our speaker, Ashutosh Vashne is sole Goldman Professor of International Study at the Social Sciences and Professor of Political Science at Brown University, where he also directs the Saxena Center for Contemporary South Asia. Previously, he taught at Harvard University and University of Michigan Ann Arbor. He has published extensively, including the books, Battles Half One, subtitled India's Improbable Democracy, Ethnic Conflict and Civic Life, Subtitled Hindus and Muslims in India, Democracy, Development, and the Countryside, Urban Rural Struggles in India, India in the Era of Economic Reforms, 
end collective violence in Indonesia. His honors include the Guggenheim and Carnegie Fellowships and the Gregory Lubert and Daniel Lerner Prizes. His academic articles have appeared in leading professional journals of political science and development. He's a columnist for the Indian Express newspaper and editor-in-chief of the Modern South Asia series published by Oxford University Press, New York. Over to you, Ashu. Thank you. Uh, can I can I get the co-sharing? Okay. You should have that already. Just hit share screen and it should pop up. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, this is a terrific uh, lecture series that you planned and it's a pleasure to participate though my account of India's democratic backsliding um, is not a very happy one. Um, let me uh, summarize my argument first for you, and then we will take it from there. Um, um, I'll develop this argument, of course, in detail uh, in this lecture. India's democracy is recognized by democratic theorists worldwide as historically exceptional, uh, especially given its level of income, something I'll say more about later. <clears throat> But this claim applies mostly to India as an electoral democracy, and India has functioned less well as a liberal democracy. Um, this particular distinction, electoral democracy and liberal democracy, uh, this conceptual distinction will play a central role in my argument. India's democratic evolution has reached a stage where the electoral and liberal aspects of democracy are now in a deep conflict. India's electoral vibrancy continues substantially, if not as vigorously as before, but very substantially still. But the liberalism of its polity is in serious decline. Elite choices based on values, ideologies, interests are central to understanding both why democracy arose in the beginning and has lasted for so long, and why a decline has set in. The primary cause of democratic backsliding in India is the ideology that guides Prime Minister Modi's party in politics. The ideology is receiving widespread electoral support, but is fundamentally illiberal and fundamentally anti-minority, and hence the deepening clash between the electoral and the liberal. I might add, and uh, I'm speaking to um, a primarily American audience, uh, so this particular comparison may be of, of considerable interest. I just spoke uh, two weeks ago in Camden, Maine, where a number of questions were asked about this comparison that I'm proposing, and it's already out as an article in Journal of Democracy two months ago. What's happening is not very different from the evolution of white majoritarianism in Jim Crow South and Jim Crow American South. The equality given to African Americans during the Reconstruction, 1865 to 1880, via the 13th, 14th, and 15th constitutional amendments, was taken away in 11 ex Confederate states. Between 1890 and 1910, um, all of these states had so called the so-called Jim Crow constitutions in place, which lasted till 1965. Blacks became second-class citizens, not only politically, but also legally. Some, and, and, and they were given equality with, during the Reconstruction after the end of the Civil War and after the uh, abolition of slavery, especially through the 14th and 15th Amendment. Something similar has started happening to Muslims of India, they are 14% of the population, Hindus are about 80%. So um, 
the largest minority of India is the Muslims of India, and something similar is happening to them. This trend might deepen further. It is at its early stages. <clears throat> um, okay. So um, let me uh, briefly summarize some major scholars, some of, the, some of the leading scholars in my profession, in my discipline of political science, who have talked about India in a comparative perspective. Here is Barrington Moore in 1966, the first major scholar to note 17, um, um, uh, 19 years after India's independence, um, to note the exceptional nature of Indian democracy. As a political species, India does belong to the modern world. At the time of Nehru's death in 1964, political democracy had existed for 17 years. If imperfect, the democracy was no mere sham. Political democracy may seem strange both in an Asian setting and in a setting without an industrial revolution. This was 1966. Then Robert Dahl in 1989, perhaps the leading, arguably the leading, in my view, uh, incontestably the leading, but you know some may disagree with that, but they will not disagree with the claim that he is uh, um, arguably the leading or one of the leading uh, democratic theorists uh, after 1945. And he's written quite a lot about India. And here is uh, from his most important book published in 1989, India is a leading contemporary exception to democratic theory. And then uh, another uh, decade and a half or a little over a decade after that, Another major uh, uh, senior colleague of ours in the profession, Adam Shavorsky, wrote that odds against democracy in India were extremely high, um, but India has remained democratic with the exception of 18 or 19 months between 1975 and 77, when democracy was formally suspended and India had the so-called period of emergency. <clears throat> now, let me start with... Uh, key elements, a summary of the key elements of modern democratic theory, and place India's experience both until uh, both uh, the early experience, as well as what's been happening of late, um, um, and in that context or against that context. Here are the, the here is a summary of the, the, the key elements of democratic. There's a minimum requirement and there's a broader requirement. The minimum requirement is elections. No elections, no democracy. That is, it's a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition. The broader requirements are not only about elections, but also about politics between elections. What happens in the four or five years between elections? And a special emphasis in this broader theoretical claim is, is, uh, is made to liberal freedoms or civil liberties especially three, freedom of expression, freedom of religious practice, and freedom of association, which essentially means non-governmental organizations, including churches and, and uh, places of, uh, of, uh, of religious importance. Plus, apart from those three freedoms, also uh, the idea of minority protections is an extremely important um, element of the broader requirement. Now, uh, other than these two, uh, you also have uh, two empirical claims which have emerged comparatively by looking at democracies all over the world. One is the relationship between income and democracy. Democracies can be established at low levels of income for sure, but they survive generally at high levels of income. Their mortality rate at low levels of income is very high. You can say in, a, in simple terms, that uh, according to this argument, democracy is basically a rich country game. Um, and uh, it is unlikely to survive in countries that are not rich. And India is still not rich. It's, uh, still a mid it's become a middle-income country over the last 15 years, but it's not a rich country. And then there is also another empirical claim uh, based on a comparative study of who votes in in the west 
um, both in Europe and, and, the, and North America. And the conclusion is very clear. The richer and the more educated the voter, the higher the odds of voting. The poorer and the less educated the voter, the lower the odds of voting. That's also a, 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 a fairly well-established empirical claim. So let me now begin with India's electoral vibrancy, and then we come to the liberal uh, dimensions. Since 1952, when India had its first elections, five years after, roughly five years after independence, there have been 17 national elections and 388 state elections. Power has changed hands eight times in Delhi and tens of times at the state level. In 1952, 81 million votes were cast. In 2019, the last election, the last national election, nearly 610 million, uh, million votes were cast. And turnouts now are routinely in excess of 60%. American turnouts, incidentally, after 1945 have rarely touched 60%, but they are routinely now in excess of 60% in India. And in the last two elections, 2014 and 2019, the turnouts were over 65% the two highest ever turnouts in Indian, Indian uh, post-independence history. Narendra Modi, India's current prime minister, won, in other words, two most participatory elections in history. <clears throat> and even today, the another aspect of electoral vibrancy is, even today, uh, out of 28 state governments, 14 are... 14 are not run by the BJP, the party that rules the federal center. Nearly half of state governments, half of state governments are, are, are in control of political parties that do not run Delhi, that are not in control of Delhi. Until 1999, Following mainstream democratic theory that I summarized for you, the richer and more educated citizens used to vote more than the poorer and the less educated. Since 1989, defying democratic theory, the poor and the less educated have voted as much as, if not more than, their more fortunate co-citizens. That is why we say there is a plebeian turn in India's democratic evolution. It is going... Uh, down and down in terms of uh, uh, who votes and where they are placed in the social structure. Now, here is a, a comparative graph on India compared to some world regions. So this is the Indian line, the red one. And this is the, the uh, Western European and North American line. So until very recently, until let's say last seven, eight, 10 years, India's line of democracy, India's score, score, democratic score, was only lower than that of North, North America, with some a little bit of exception here. Only lower than that of North America and Western Europe. And higher than any other region, and of course higher, than the world average, which is represented by this line. So, uh, and things of course have changed, as you can see, uh, towards the right end of this graph, things have changed, but historically, this performance is second only to the two richest parts of the world, North America and Western Europe. That's based on the scores of democracy, the scores that you can give to various democracies in the world for each year of its performance. Now, <clears throat> let's go through the argument about, about why this is called improbable or called exceptional. Adam Shavorsky, whom I mentioned right in the beginning, has put together the largest data set of all political scientists which covers 141 countries between 1950 and 1990 to understand what predicts democratic longevity, democratic sustainability, or democratic um, um, life, um, long democratic life best. And income turns out to be the best predictor. It is not the only predictor. It is the best predictor. It correctly predicted the regime type in 77.5% of the cases 
but not in all. 22.5% of the cases were not predicted by income. And India clearly belongs to this set, the 22.5%. And if you only concentrate on democracies that emerged from decolonization after the Second World War, then they survived only in the following countries, India, Mauritius, Belize, Jamaica, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, and Vanuatu. That's what it is. Solomon and Islands and Vanuatu, as you may know, are very, very small. Uh, others are also quite small, but not as small as Solomon Islands and Vanuatu. And India, of course, is a giant in this in this, in this. this. Uh, on this list. Um, and so they conclude that the odds against, given India's level of income, it was a low level, low income country until roughly 2005, 2006, depending on how you cut it. According to the World Bank around 2007, 2008, it ceased to be a low income country, which means for something like uh, uh, 50 odd years, India was democratic despite being a low-income country. That's why they claim the odds against democracy in India were extremely high. And as a parenthetically, it might be noted, just as a footnote, that if India is the biggest exception on the low-income end, Singapore is the greatest surprise on the high-income side. Its per capita income today is higher than that of UK, France, and Germany, and in recent years, also higher than the United States, incidentally. No non-oil rich country is undemocratic, only Singapore is. Just, just, to, just a, a bit of a comparison here, not particularly, um, uh, just to say that income does not fully determine, it, 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 uh, it, it's predicting something like three-fourths of the cases, not one-fourth, which of all cases, and there uh, in India belongs to that one-fourth. And there too, it is among the lowest income in the exceptional, um, uh, among the exceptional cases. Now let's go to the liberal, idea of liberal democracy. From elections to the idea of liberal deficits in India's performance. They're the, the standard liberal freedoms or, or rights that are counted as important to or significant for the broader conception of a democracy. Freedom of expression, is it strong or not? Freedom of religious practice, is it strong or not? Freedom of association, meaning not, can non-governmental organizations be formed easily? Business associations, NGOs, uh, religious organizations, non-governmental um, uh, non, non schools, non and unions, etc., etc. Um, and uh, does the country have, does the polity have minority rights? A bit more about minority rights in a moment. That's a very important uh, uh, point to discuss, important matter. Now, these freedoms are considered especially important for democracy between elections, those four and five years between elections. Why? Once the minimum criteria of of what is called contestation, pre-contestation and participation of all, these criteria are satisfied. A democracy can attain higher quality, meaning it can become deeper if liberal freedoms between elections are also available. That is, if citizens are free to speak, free to associate, free to practice their faith. Thus, we cannot have a democracy without free elections, but a democracy would be more meaningful if non-electoral dimensions of freedom not simply free vote were also available. So in the broader conception, with, we, we cannot have our, a broader democracy, uh, a democracy beyond its electoral uh, uh, side, which is a necessary side, unless you have these freedoms available and available in a robust way. Now, here is the argument. Those are the three freedoms that are important to the, the, the concept of broader democracy or, or deeper democracy. And here is the special case for minority rights. All post-1945 democracies, that's important. This is, this is a development after 1945, after the Second World War. Not only based on the, are not only based on the idea of power, political power stemming from electoral majorities, but also on minority protections. Majorities can protect themselves by their numerical weight. Minorities don't have the numbers. 
Hence, minority rights constitutionally protected in modern democracies. And without minority protections, democracy can easily become a brute majoritarian force. Consider the two best known examples of that. There are many, but two best known examples. Let me just give one, Nazi Germany and Jim Crow American South. I'll say something about Jim Crow American South later. Nazi Germany. Karl Schmitt, a leading German theorist, legal and political theorist, who ended up joining the Nazis, drew a distinction between democracy and liberalism. Democracy to him was about expression of majority wishes, nothing else. And liberalism meant protection of individual freedoms and minority rights. So he argued Jews in Germany could be protected under liberalism, but not under democracy. Meaning, if a majority of Germans wanted Jews to be um, turned into second class citizens, or even exterminated. That would have to be called a democratic wish, even if it was fundamentally inconsistent with liberalism or requirements of liberalism. That was the distinction. This distinction was given up after the anti-Jewish horrors of Europe in the 1930s and 40s. All post-1945 democracies tend to have rights for religious, racial, or ethnic minorities built into their political fabric. If they don't, they might not be undemocratic, assume, assuming they have free elections, but they are less democratic than they could be. This is the idea here. Three freedoms, freedom of expression, freedom of, re freedom of religious practice, freedom of association, civil society, and minority rights. Three freedoms and minority protections constitute the broader meaning of democracy beyond elections. How about liberal freedoms in India now, in light of this theory? India is freest at the time of elections. Short of inciting violence, virtually any argument can be made in election campaigns. But once an elected government takes over, restrictions on liberal liberties are often placed. Intellectuals, writers, artists, journalists, professors, student organizations, non-governmental organizations, can face harassment on grounds that they hurt the sentiments of certain groups or undermine national interest. These problems have been common to all kinds of government. Example, Salman Rushdie's satanic verses was banned under a, Cong under a Congress party government because Muslim right protested. Also under Congress party government, M.F. Hussain, uh, India's leading painter, had to migrate uh, leave the country. He couldn't be protected there. He had to leave the country because Hindu right did not like his paintings of Hindu goddesses. But these problems become especially serious when Hindu nationalists come to power, as is true in India since 2014. They, they were in power twice uh, before for a period of six years, but in coalition. And now they've been power with, on the strength of their own numbers. Why? Minorities automatically get added to the list of targets, not simply writers or artists. A Hindu-centric view of the nation leads to this. India, for Hindu nationalists, is a primarily Hindu nation, which is a fundamentally unconstitutional idea. I'll say something about the, how constitution looks at this. Um, Hindu may be 80% 80, 80 of India, and minority is 20% of India. But the constitution clearly defined India as a multi-religious country where no religion will have primacy. All religion will, religions will be equal and the state will be religiously neutral. So the idea of uh, uh, India as a Hindu nation is very much like the idea that America is a white nation, which is also is a fundamentally unconstitutional idea, though it's been very powerful in American history, in cer certainly in certain parts of America. Now, let's look at the most recent developments over the last 10 years, or, or certainly since 2019, but last 10 years old, since Mr. Modi has been in power. A law passed in Parliament in July 2019, very soon after Mr. Modi returned to power a second time, UAPA Amendment Act, gives the government power to designate individuals as terrorists, 
and keep them in jail for months before effective judicial remedy is available. This is what is called, has been called in many legal uh, uh, scholarship, in many, uh, many strands of legal scholarship, preventive detention without legal approval and without habeas corpus. Or judicial appeals when allowed are more or less meaningless if the government's argument is based on security, internal or external. If a person, an individual, is arrested by the government on grounds of internal, external security, then even ju the judicial remedies are virtually impossible. They can be in jail for a very long time. Um, now, let's turn to, that's just an example of, of, uh, of, of freedom um, uh, um, of whether you can arrest someone without justifying the arrest, that the government can arrest someone without justifying the arrest in a court of law and without judicial approval. It can do so by simply calling that particular individual a security threat internally or externally. Um, now let's go to beleaguered Muslim minority. This is this will take up quite a lot of the remaining time. There was a Citizenship Amendment Act passed in December of 2019. It amended India's citizenship law. It is a bifocal move. One that has already been passed says it that that India will exclude Muslim immigrants as citizens while accepting all of the communities from Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Bangladesh, India's neighboring countries, on grounds of persecution. Only Muslims coming from there cannot be given citizenship, will not be given citizenship. All other, all non-Muslims will be. There, there was no such distinction in India's citizenship law passed in 1956. 5556. And second, there is also a promise to introduce a National Register of Citizens, NRC, which will most likely render stateless all those Muslims who don't have the documents to prove their Indian ancestry, even if they were born in India and have lived in the country for decades. India has 14% of India adds up to about 200-odd million Muslim, uh, citizens. It, so that's, that means 200-odd million Muslims. Since 200-odd millions cannot be deported or interned and put in, in internment camps, the real threat here is electoral. Millions of Muslims, if they lack documents, will cease to be citizens, losing their voting rights because only citizens can vote, and you can also imagine they would lose their welfare benefits. Hindus lacking documents of uh, uh, can in principle be covered by the Citizenship Amendment Act and will not lose citizenship or voting rights. This idea, this bifocal move, one law already passed, the other announced but not yet passed as law, can easily become a project of Muslim disenfranchisement as for, for sure, and possibly Muslims uh, use, uh, losing welfare benefits. 10 to 11 state governments of India have declined to implement this. The project is stalled right now, but may re-emerge later, as soon as in the next six months, if Mr. Modi wins power in May. Its ideological thrust is very clear. Now, let's look at rise of anti-Muslim violence, vigilante violence. Riots used to be the principal form of Hindu-Muslim violence in India. Riots are defined as clashes between civilian mobs. Uh, the police, there may be doubts about the neutrality of the police, but the police does not abandon the principle of neutrality. Those riots have declined since the mid-1990s. Since 2014, however, a relatively new form of communal violence has emerged, lynchings. And there, the police is not neutral. Muslims are the main victims, and such activity does not receive clear, timely, or forthright denunciation from BJP governments, both at the center and in the states, and cops in BJP states simply look the other way as lynchings take place. 
let me now show you some data. Here is vigilantism, vigilante violence, lynching since 2009 until 2019. And we are unable to collect data after that. There is not, the government has made it virtually impossible to, for, for, for us scholars to collect data on this. So 2009 to roughly, you can see it until 2014, you don't have a trend. You have basically a, a, what is called a random walk. And then there is a rising trend. This is after Mr. Modi's rise to power. Rising trend. This is lynchings in India 2009 to 2020. Who are the main victims? This line, this line is the Muslim line. This line is the Hindu line. And this line is the Christian line. So it's not that only Muslims are the victims of, of vigilante violence or lynchings. But they are the largest victims, many times more than the Hindus and Muslims. Hindus are 80% of India, Muslims are 14% of India, Christians are 2% of India, 2.1%, 2.2% of India. But the community that is 14% of India is lynched at a much higher rate than the community that is 80% of India. And community that is 2% of India also should be you know, should not be should not be here, but at any rate, you can see that. The more important thing is that the community that 80% is represented by this line and the community that is 14% is represented by this line, many, many times more, um, many times higher. <clears throat> now, what what are the what are what do the vigilante organizations lynch Muslims for? There are three arguments. The ostensible aim is to prevent the eating of beef and production and selling of cow meat, premised on the claim that cows are sacred to Hinduism. Though you should note that cow that beef is eaten in by Hindus in many several parts of India, but that is their belief that is particularly important in northern and western India is that cows are sacred to Hinduism and therefore beef eating cannot be allowed. And if you eat beef and Muslims do, then you can be lynched for that reason. Or if you sell, if you have cow trade, if you're in, in cow trade and cattle trade, then you can be, if you're, if you're transporting cattle, then you can also be lynched for that reason. Hindu conversion to Islam, premised on the claim that such conversion is never honest and always promoted by coercion, deceit, or material temptation. Three, young Muslim men must be prevented from marrying Hindu women. This particular project is premised on the claim that these such marriages, young Muslim men marrying Hindu women, not the other way around. These are aimed at increasing the size of Muslim population, which if not stopped now, would eventually overwhelm the Hindu population. 14% will become bigger than what is 18% today, is the claim. The real claim, aim is creation of Hindu primacy, as I'll show you in a moment. Now, the biggest move towards Hindu primacy and supremacy yet was the consecration of a very large, grand Hindu temple in, uh, in the city of, in the town of Ayodhya on January 22nd, 2024, which I watched live while driving from the city of Jaipur to city of Delhi on January 22nd in India. Though it was court approved, this, uh, uh, the re rebuilding of the temple on a contested site, it was court approved. What was not approved by the court is that the building and consecration should be, should be undertaken by the state, by the government. So it is the biggest symbolic and discursive move for that reason. Millions watched the consecration on TV and online and thousands were present in person. Modi government violated a core commitment of India's constitution, namely religious neutrality of the state, when India's prime minister, along with two other high constitutional authorities, consecrated a Hindu temple in a huge state-sponsored occasion. The chief of the RSS, which is the mother organization of Hindu nationalism, mother organization BJP, was seated next to the prime minister. The RSS has been claiming right since its birth in 1925 that India is and should be a Hindu nation 
and the laws and the constitution should express that view and 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 therefore it was opposed to the constitution of india when it was inaugurated in 1950 now the rhetoric of prime minister modi's speech openly displayed the new ideology the hindu supremacy he used and this is the hindu i'm using only pulling out only two statements made in that speech ram se rajya or niti tak ram lord ram hindu god ram as the basis for indian statecraft ram se rashtri chetna ka vikas ram lord ram as a medium for the spread of national consciousness if modi wins again in may 2024 which is widely viewed as very likely the most important question will be what laws will be brought in through his control over parliament to give the idea of hindu super supremacy secure legal foundations it will move from politics and rhetoric to laws there have been the basically there has been only one big law so far which has announced uh, which has taken an anti muslim form in parliament which was the citizenship amendment act Muslim immigrants from the neighboring areas cannot be made citizens, but non-Muslim immigrants can be. Was the idea? Will India, or at least the BJP-dominated states, have a Jim Crow-style political order? Not, of course, for white supremacy, but for Hindu supremacy, all ostensibly electorally legitimated in elections. Electoral democracy has now the potential. for a serious potential for undermining the multi religious constitutional order and establishing a hindu political order or hindu majoritarianism as a constitutional principle let me now it's 842 let me try and summarize rather than go through some more theory let me give you some final thoughts um in the next 2 3 minutes that will be 846 847 then india's uh, for for me here in boston for you uh, 740 for 746 747 747 india's recent democratic decline is not because elections are not free they might be less free than before they might become less free than before in may 24 but less free is different from unfree unfree and free are binary categories 0 or 1 less free is on a scale of 0 to 1 closer to 1 or closer to 0 not 0 or 1 so that's a, that is placed on a scale quantitative scale not on a binary india remains electorally vigorous the decline concerns the liberal dimension of democracy and that decline is rooted in an ideology which seeks hindu supremacy hindu primacy above all it is not very different from the idea of white supremacy in american history especially in jim crow american south 1880 to 1965 liberal democracy while it might not might not have flourished as much in north in north uh, in the northern part of the country as liberals desired certainly as the coastal liberals desired but it was dead in american south for those eight decades it ended in 1965 with the passing of the voting rights act and civil rights act <clears throat> in in um, in washington um now um let me leave it at that um if you want i can compare the the emerging trends in india and what was beginning to emerge in 1880s and 1890s america the constitution jim crow constitutions in america were established between 1890 and 1910 all 11 ex confederate states had jim crow constitutions it took uh, the 13th 13th 14th the 14th and 15th amendment were fairly vigorous until roughly 1880 1880 to 1890 vigilante violence lynchings rose very substantially very very substantially and once laws came in play were put in place between 1890 and 1910 lynchings declined 
as the idea of white supremacy was legally and constitutionally protected and founded in, in, in the 11 state constitutions of the ex-Confederate states. Um, thank you for, for your attention. All right, we have a couple questions from the chat. Uh, let me just uh, put in for a minute, just to ask a couple of questions myself. Yeah. Uh, one question I have is about uh, regional unity in India. You know, when you, uh, in India, unlike many other countries, we have a kind of unity of language, uh, culture, and uh, you know which cuts across the religious lines right and india is more or less divided along the uh, language right right so the question i have is that this kind of cohesiveness that we have at the regional level in india does that kind of work against modi government's efforts to create a majoritarian hindu rule that is correct the the, as I said, in roughly half of states, uh, BJP doesn't rule. Um, it rules some of the biggest states, but basically, um, basically it's the North and the West. And in the South, it has actually, at this point, no BJP government. There is no, not a single BJP government in India South. And India's, uh, East also, it is not present except in the Northeast where uh, Northeastern states where you're basically 25 seats out of 543 in parliament. Um, generally speaking, generally speaking, with some exceptions, um, those are states of India which are non-Hindi speaking. Uh, there are 28 states in India. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven are Hindi speaking. Um, could be eight. I might have missed one. Yeah, are Hindi speaking, but uh, others are not Hindi speaking. Um, the um, the North Indian states are generally bigger um, than. Um, the South Indian states in particular, uh, the biggest South Indian state is Tamil Nadu. Uh, and, and yes, India's feder federalism is linguistically based, unlike Amer American federalism. India's yes. federalism is linguistically based. Since India has um, uh, up to 20 languages, uh, major languages, um, you will have to say something like 15 to 20 major languages. Each major language has a state of its own, um, where uh, the uh, lingua franca or the language of the state is the state, is the uh, language official communication um, is based on the, the official communication of the state is based on the language of the state. So um, the majoritarian project, uh, you ri rightly pointed out, has run up against this obstacle. And it's not clear how this will be resolved. Um, it's possible to say the following. Suppose the National Registry of Citizens law is passed in parliament, but is rejected by, let's say, 12, 13, 14 states out of 28 then you'll have a serious constitutional crisis. Very serious constitutional crisis. And uh, how it's going to be resolved, I, I don't know. In principle, unlike uh, American federalism, where Washington cannot suspend a state government, Washington cannot suspend a state government. Delhi can suspend state governments using Article 356. India's constitution has provision for Delhi suspending a state government. So if 12 to 14, if you can imagine a, a situation which is very hard to imagine, almost unimaginable, I would say. Suppose 14 state governments say if they will not uh, implement uh, NRC and CAA, suppose they say, they say that, then one way 
to obtain their obedience is by suspending those governments. Can Delhi suspend 13, 14 state governments? I think it's unimaginable. It will be a very serious constitutional crisis. But some people are willing to argue that, that that method ought to be used if parliament passes the law and state some state governments say they won't obey the law. Thank you. Uh, just one more question about the media control. Uh, you didn't speak a whole lot about you know how the Modi government controls and to what extent is the media controlled in India at this point. Could you... Uh, there are obviously some uh, anti-government or uh, newspapers that are still being published, like Indian Express and Hindu and, and also NDTV. So there are examples that I can think of where all media is not a mouthpiece for the government. So to what extent, extent is the media control affecting the project by the government to essentially have a... Yes, so with very few exceptions, media is now under the control of the government. It's not directly owned by the government. The way the government has, Modi government has exercised control is by um, persuading the owners, the private owners, or forcing the uh, uh, the owners of the media to toe the line. Um, those who have uh, the paper for which I write, uh, yes, does fight. You're right to say that. The Hindu fights, the Telegraph in, in, uh, fights. Um, very few Hindi newspapers fight. And NDTV, you mentioned it was independent. Um, I have appeared at least 100 times on NDTV, maybe more. But but not in the last few years. It's been taken over by uh, businessmen, bought by a businessman who is uh, widely viewed as very close to Mr. Modi and is actually very close to Mr. Modi, and received a lot of benefits from from Mr. Modi's policies. So yes, it was not. It is not by directly, but we are direct government control, but we are control of the owners who own these uh, media organizations, both on television and um, in print. And uh, the freest media right now, on the whole, is the, is, the, is the media on YouTube, the social media. YouTubers are the, are the freest, but it's not, it is not clear. Uh, a, a law is in the making. It's not clear that the YouTube content uh, will not be uh, under uh, surveillance or, or under legal restrictions or under excessive regulation before long. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like, to, I'd like to encourage audience members to kind of put your questions in the chat box and we'll have the uh, uh, Bob, Dr. Bob Fusen is going to then take over and read out the questions to you. Okay. This question is in regards to income levels. Our first one, what definition of income are you using? Average GDP per person or median income? And they go on to add, my question on income was really if income inequality affected democracy. It appears not to be a major factor in your analysis. Yes. So uh, it's GDP per capita, basically. Uh, per capita income, not median income. It's the average. Um, total national income divided by the population. So uh, that's what it is, not median. Um, income inequalities, there is a theory. Uh, uh, the person who's asked this question is clearly aware of the theory that uh, democracies uh, generally do not survive in conditions of very high inequality and in conditions of, of great income uh, equality also. So there is a, a way to measure that. That's a Gini coefficient. A Gini coefficient, the values fluctuate between 0 and 1 
one means complete inequality and zero means complete equality. The countries that tend closer to zero, and these were generally speaking the communist countries, um, and below the communist countries were the Nordic countries. Uh, you don't you don't basically see a Gini coefficient of easily be, of less than 0.2, and you don't easily see a Gini coefficient of that is higher than 0.75 or 0.8. So the argument about in income inequality, if you believe in this theory, this is um, Achamaglu and Robinson, their, their book uh, makes a big, very big case about income relationship between income inequality and, and democratic longevity. Um, uh, if you believe in this, uh, India would not be a problem for, this, for the income inequality based theory because while India is unequal, its Gini coefficient has never crossed 0.5 or 0.55 or so. 0.5 is the highest I know, which is incidentally is also the highest that America has reached in terms of uh, America's denominator is huge, of course. India's denominator is not that, that, that big. But um, uh, income inequality in, in India hasn't touched, never touched 0 0.7, 0 0.75 which has been the South Africa story, which has been the Brazilian story before Lula, which, is, which was the Sierra Leone story, um, and has never, of course, gone down to 0 0.2, 0 0.15, 0 0.18, uh, 0 0.1, which would be the former communist, communist countries, um, and China under Mao, not China after Mao, but China under Mao. Uh, the Gini coefficient was never measured, but most people believe it was below 0.2. Uh, and perhaps as as close to point one as as any society ever came. So yes, it's a, an excellent argument, excellent question. But India is in India's democracy is not affected by the general validity of this question. Our next question: Is it not true in India, as in our other cases, that a large part of society is illiberal, not believing the equality of all citizens, and autocratic leaders like Modi play appeal to this citizen base to gain and hold power? In India, there are many illiberal Hindus. Are there many illiberal Hindus who like what Modi has been doing? That is fundamentally correct. Uh, democratic theory, uh, dem democracy scholars have often. Uh, wrestled with the the electoral data, it's not persistent. It's not persistent. It, it's episodic. In certain <clears throat> at certain times in the history of democracies, you've had a fairly large popular support for autocratic leaders, for strong men. Uh, Mr. Trump belongs to that category, according to Democrat democracy theorists today. Uh, all the cases that you've discussed certainly belong to that, and Mr. Trump also, actually. And the, if, you, uh, if you ask whether these leaders are popular or not, well, they are. So uh, uh, while this is not a persistent or or uh, normal feature of uh, democracies, uh, but it is certainly episodic enough to be called a feature that appears um, at certain historical times in certain historical periods and makes, um, makes illiberalism, um, denial of right to freedom, right to free speech, denial of uh, freedom of association, right to free speech, denial of religious rights, and denial of minority protections. Uh, minorities could be ethnic, racial, or religious. Um, uh, the denial of all these liberal freedoms and protections are sometimes very popular. And so leaders are elected who believe that an attack on free, free association, free speech, free, uh, re, uh, free, free religious practice, and minority rights, uh, an attack on, on, on all of these features is perfectly democratic because elections and popular support have legitimated that. 
<laughs> the attack on uh, black rights, it is very clear, um, on uh, in the American South during 1880 and 1965 was quite popular. The popularity begins to decline around in the 1950s or so. Civil rights movement rises and uh, and it, it begins to change opinions. Part of the opinion is also changed uh, by how Democratic Party, starting 1948, began to say that we cannot have um, a two-tiered citizenship in any part of the country um, after after America's fight against Nazi Germany during the Second World War. So you have that argument emerging as early as 1948 in American political process. And uh, and and yes, so so the point that the, 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 the person who's asking this question is asking a very good and a very difficult question, uh, namely that democracies at times begin to legitimate through vote through support illiberal practices and aut autocrats. How does Modi rationalize the BJP persecution of Muslims given the constitution's stance that the government is to be religiously neutral? Modi's argument is historical. Uh, he says that India's colonization uh, did not begin with British conquest of India starting 1757. The first colonizers were the Muslim king uh, invaders from the Middle East. He says, uh, and that is part of the that is part of the ideology of Hindu nationalism. It's there in every every ideological text of Hindu nationalism that Indian colonization began in 711, when a part of India, Sindh, which is now in Pakistan, which was un, which was part of undivided India. Um, uh, was captured by um, a, a general of the Umayyad Caliphate, captured only for four years. Um, he said that that's when India's colonization, and he used the term, he, he made this argument, not in that specific terms, but used the term, India's slavery began then. Uh, in, in his speech to uh, the two houses of Congress in June, when he was the state guest of America, and not only uh, was he uh, hosted as a as a, a state guest by by President Biden, but the two houses also invited him to give a, a speech to the joint house, a joint meeting of the house of the two houses, and he used the term slavery for more than a thousand years. Um, and then you have uh, 1206 is the arrival of Delhi Sultanate. And the most controversial for, for Hindu nationalists is the rise of Mughal rulers after 1526, right till uh, 1757, when the British conquest begins. So um, the claim, the historical claim is that Hindus, India's major majority community and India's original peoples, quote unquote, original peoples, historians have dispute over, over that. But anyway, that's not the, the political argument. The political argument of Mr. Modi and his party and his uh, ideological, uh, the, the, the mother organization of Hindu nationalism is that India's colonization began more than a thousand years ago not, uh, with the arrival of Muslim kings and and, and uh, and uh, um, and this was not recognized by India's constitution. So that it, the Hindu primacy or Hindu uh, supremacy of India or Hindu ownership of India was unjustly, they say, unjustly denied by the constitution. And the principle of religious neutrality that the constitution um, um, propagated or constitution placed at the heart of the document, of the constitutional document, um, was simply wrong and unfair and unjust to Hindus. And Hindu primacy must be restored. So the argument is that history, uh, uh, the historical injustices, quote unquote, of, of, of lasting many centuries will, will have to be constitutionally corrected. The fact that the Constitution talks about religious neutrality is simply wrong. 
and that particular uh, article of constitutional faith requires serious correction. And if he gets two thirds majority in parliament in, in, the, in the upcoming elections, if he does get two thirds majority in parliament, then a constitutional amendment uh, under Indian laws is possible. And this, the idea of religious neutrality can, uh, can be uh, decimated, uh, can be overturned by, by parliament through a two thirds vote. Do you foresee a very serious explosion of communal violence in India in the coming years? Well, um, uh, communal violence has many forms. I have studied riots and pogroms. I, I wrote, I published that book some 20, 2002, so 20, 21, 20, 21 years ago. Um, and it's unlikely that riots will return. Riots are defined as clashes within civilian mobs when the state does not give up its principle of neutrality and does not side with one community systematically. There may be doubts that it, it um, didn't live up to the principle of neutrality, which is how a modern state is defined. Um, but but it doesn't give up that principle. In pogroms, uh, pogroms are a particular kind of riots where the state gives up the principle of neutrality either in practice or in principle. There have been a few pogroms in India, uh, but, not, uh, but most riots of India took the form of riots, not pogroms. The pogroms were very vicious because the state sided with one community. The term pogrom was born in Darist Russia when anti-Semitic riots would, would take place and the state would look aside. The cops would just look aside and not intervene and save, save the Jews. Um, so that's the idea. That's where the, uh, the idea came and became part of the violence literature. And it's a concept now. Um, lynchings. Lynchings have uh, the, the characteristics of... Uh, of uh, uh, pogroms, but they're also different. Uh, pog in pogroms, you attack of uh, an entire community um, with uh, either the explicit permission of the state or the state not intervening to protect the community being attacked. Uh, lynchings are a community, a group, a large group attacking one, two, three, four people, not an entire community. Symbolically, it's an attack on a community, but the actual act of violence is aimed at one or two or three in each incident. However, if the state looks aside and doesn't intervene to protect the people being lynched, which was true in American South, which is increasingly true in India, uh, then uh, you have uh, you have pogrom-like characteristics without the scale of pogroms. So, am I predicting more riots? No. Am I predicting some pogroms? Yes. Am I predicting uh, lynchings rising? Yes. Uh, there is a fourth kind of violence, which we study as, as scholars of violence: civil wars. So when the minority in, uh, in Sri Lanka, the Tamil minority was attacked by the Sinhala majority, then, uh, and the, the political attack began in, in the in 1950s, and then it became more and more violent over time. Then by 1983-84, a civil war began. But I'm not predicting a civil war in India. A, a requirement of a civil war, and not a Hindu-Muslim civil war, not like a Tamil Sinhala civil war. The requirement of a civil war typically is that the minority be geographically concentrated, as Tamils were in the northern part of Sri Lanka. So uh, that is normally a requirement. I mean, the um, American South rebelled against the idea after Lincoln came to power, the, the whole of South was involved in that. In order for a civil war to take place, there has to be regional concentration of rebels or those who are attacking 
the, the central state. Now, Muslims are not concentrated except in, uh, uh, in, in Kashmir Valley, where they are 95% of the population. Muslims of India are spread all over India in different numbers, but they're spread literally all over India. They are not like Tamils of Sri Lanka concentrated in the north. All, the very large proportion of Tamils was in the north of Sri Lanka. And of course, American South, when it rebelled, the South and North was clearly a, a geographical distinction along with some political, important political distinctions. So no, I'm not predicting a civil war. I'm predicting uh, more pogroms and I'm predicting uh, more lynchings. Um, and uh, there is only one example I know where the minority after being attacked in, in, in after 1945, the only one example I know of, of the ones that I've studied where the minority after being attacked accepted its secondary place because being, because accepting one secondary place was was equal to preserving stability and preserving stability was important to their economic fortunes. So for example, the Chinese in Malaysia after 1969, uh, after, after awful rioting in 1969 decided that there was no way they could go back to China where Mao was going through a cultural revolution. China was going through a cultural revolution and was in a very bad shape. There was no way they were going to go back to China. Their home was Malaysia. So the Chinese basically accepted their secondary status being given to them by the Malays and became part of the polity that way. Um, uh, they, I have studied uh, the Malays in, in, in the, the Chinese and Malay relationship uh, in Malaysia. Resentment is very high, but it didn't take the form of violence after 1969. It didn't take the form of violence. It took the form of acceptance. Uh, the uh, Hindu nationalist dream is precisely that, that uh, Muslims should accept their second class citizen citizenship, second class status, should simply accept Hindu primacy, and that's how they live peacefully. If Muslims don't accept that, then we can see, of course, quite a lot of trouble and quite a lot of violence, though it will not be a civil war. Our next question. Whites in the South were a numerical minority in many places because of the plantation economy. Jim Crow was a way for the white elites to retain power. Hindus are clearly a numerical majority. What is the basis of this persecution or fear of Muslims? So uh, whites were a majority basically in two states. It's not true that they were in, in a majority. In, uh, blacks were a majority in all 11. No. Um, uh, Mississippi, and um, they, I think they came close to 48, 49% in South Carolina. They were not a majority, but they were very substantial. It's fair to say they were very substantial. And uh, one way um, blacks could be, could their power could be reduced by, was through poll taxes and literacy tests. But that was the way to, to take away their voting rights. By 1875, an estimated 85% of blacks in the American South had registered to vote. Um, that was clearly, you can see, politically speaking, political science scientists would call it a moment of emancipation. Within four or five years of the 15th Amendment, which gave blacks voting rights, black males voting rights, 80% um, uh, of blacks in the, in the South had registered to vote. And through literacy, uh, uh, tests and 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 poll taxes by by 1910 we get the result that uh, no in no southern state were there more than five um, percent generally there were two to three percent of the uh, of the voting population eight if down from 85 to two to three that was that's what happened over 30 years 30 to 40 years now um i so uh, the argument uh, that the person who's asked this question would certainly apply to Mississippi and South Carolina, um, but won't be generally applicable, though in a, in a, in a way it is, in that um, blacks were not, blacks were uh, 12 to 14 percent of all of America, but not 12 to 14 percent of American South at that time. 
Blacks were, uh, were a very um, a substantial population of the South. Uh, I think nowhere less than 30%. Um, nowhere in those 11 states less than 30%, if I recall my data correctly. So, oh, but the basic question is right. What are, um, um, oh, what are Hindus afraid of? It's first of all, we shouldn't say Hindus afraid of. Only half of um, Hindus so far have voted for, roughly half, have voted for Mr. Modi in the last election. Uh, actually, not even 45, 44 to 45 percent, uh, less than half. Um, and uh, the claim there is, uh, I don't think the claim is threat, Muslim threat anymore. The claim is um, that uh, Hindu primacy, Hindu supremacy should be clearly, legally, politically, and in policy terms established. And that's for them, it's denial by the Constitution of India, it's denial by the early political leaders, the, four, the fathers of India's in, independence, uh, it, and the fathers of India's constitution, both India's independence movement, and it's denial to them is a grave injustice which must be corrected. So, um, so it's no longer a threat issue. Um, it's, a, it's an issue which says that a historical injustice, in their view, a historical injustice must be reversed. If necessary by force, if necessary by violence, if necessary by laws um, and the force of law, um, if necessary by politics, politics, laws, and 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 violence, all three combined. Um, that's the argument. 45% um, uh, voted for him. I'm not sure if you polled 45%, they would say they agree with uh, this argument. But if more than 50% of India begins to agree with this argument, India is in very deep trouble. Does India continue to have a strict caste system? And if so, how does that impact liberal democracy? This is an excellent question. <clears throat> so the um, Hindus are not united. Hindus are divided into m many, 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 many castes. And uh, each caste, with the exception of two castes, Brahmins and Dalits, there are no all India castes the top and the bottom. All castes are, are regionally specific and, uh, and even Brahmins of South India don't recognize the Brahmins of North India. Names are different, languages are different. Dalits of South India don't recognize Dalits of North India. Their names are different. Uh, they, it's not a racial categorization. Um, um, the castes are not equal to race. Uh, Castes are um, a, a very long tradition based on occupation and 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 uh, uh, deeply established norms of conduct. Now, um, the basic fight, Hindu nationalism had two fights, two basic fights. One was against the secularism or religious neutrality of the Indian constitution. The second was against the caste system also. After they, initially they were in favor of caste system, but over the last, uh, uh, after roughly 1975, 76, 77, their ideology has changed. And they would rather, they realized that caste system supporting that would never unite the Hindus. Um, and uh, incorporation of lower caste in positions of power in cooperation, lower caste uh, with upper caste, a uh, Hindu upper caste, uh, would be the way, giving them dignity, giving them power, um, giving them visible power, would be the way to make uh, caste less powerful. So the first, at, first uh, basic fight was against secularism of the constitution. Second basic fight was against caste-based politics. And it is even now, it's uh, one reason why 
they don't go very far in the South, the Hindu nationalists don't go very far in the South, is that the historical, historically enduring form of politics in South India is caste-based. In lower caste, uniting against the Brahmins. That has been the basis on the whole <coughs> of Southern politics, with very few exceptions in the South, very few. <coughs> so, so um, uh, Hindu nationalist fight is against both. And wherever, if caste politics, lower caste politics, uh, making the case that the basic contradiction of Indian society is upper caste versus lower caste, not Hindu versus Muslim. If that upper caste versus lower caste framework of politics be, be, returns in a big way, it did return, it did come back, it did uh, beca become very important in the late 1980s and 1990s and the first decade of the, of, the, of the century. If it returns in a very big way, that will certainly hurt Hindu nationalism, its onward march will be hurt. But it has managed to uh, incorporate uh, under its umbrella a lot of lower caste. For example, in 2019 elections, every third Dalit, that is the, the bottom of the social hierarchy, these were the, the these are the ex-untouchables. They were called untouchable and uh, so impure as, as, to, as to be um, not worthy of your touch. Uh, and untouchability was legally abolished when India became independent. It continued in many parts, but much lower than, than it used to be. Uh, in any case, legally, it, it, it's not, it's not, uh, it can't be practiced. It is practiced, but it's practiced in a, at a much lower level and at, in much lower magnitudes. Um, yes, so uh, every third Dalit voted for BJP and Mr. Modi in 2019. That is one of the most significant developments. And roughly half of the caste just above Dalits also voted for him. And of course, more than 70% of upper caste voted for him. So, so if so, he makes, he gives uh, uh, the lower caste and the Dalits very prominent positions in, in the party, in the government, um, sending the message that he, he wants the, all the castes of, uh, to come together and become a united Hindu community. Uh, that's not been fully done, but even if 50% come to believe this, then uh, he will have achieved a significant milestone in his political career and the ideology a significant milestone in its evolution. So yes, caste is fundamentally against Hindu national caste politics, fundamentally. But uh, the attempt of Hindu nationalists has been to lower its in intensity, to make it less, less relevant in politics and perhaps in society. <clears throat> Very good question. Thank you for asking that. <laughs> Have I lost some? Can, can you still hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, we're going to jump around with the questions a little bit to yeah. save some time. Has Modi chastised Putin for his invasion of the Ukraine? No, uh, Modi has not uh, pointedly criticized Putin, but has said that wars are not the way to change national boundaries in modern times. That's all he said. His friendship with Putin remains. And, uh, and so at least that is partial criticism, not a very direct or not a very intense criticism. And the reason is that India has had historical ties with uh, Russia and uh, India still gets a lot of its oil from Russia, and it, and Russia has offered very good deal, um, very cheap uh, oil to India. Uh, and historically, Russia has also been, and before that, the Soviet Union has also been the source of uh, 
source of um, arms, um, weapons, weaponry, and now it's been it's been changing. Uh, India is coming closer and closer to the United States, especially in def and also in defense, not especially, also in in def in the defense field, coming closer and closer and closer. However, uh, it's not yet so close that India can get rid of uh, its reliance on Russian weaponry. There is quite a lot of that, a lot of aircrafts and 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 uh, artillery and etc., which which has come from there, and and the replacements and etc. For all that, India still depends. So it, it's not going to be easy to to completely. Um, decouple India from Russia uh, in the in the defense and oil field for another 10 to 15 years. Uh, and in, in principle also India may want to be a friend of the United States and that's what it's been saying without being an alliance partner. Not form an alliance but be a friend. Um, and U United States has so far accepted that principle actually. Our last question will be, how can Modi openly act in contravention of the Constitution regarding Hindu supremacy without the highest court invalidating that provision? Excellent question, and a key question. So, so far, just as during Jim Crow, court supported Jim Crow laws, didn't oppose, Indian courts are increasingly supporting the executive, at least on key ideological issues, and coming up with an interpretation of the constitutional law which supports him. So for example, the, on the consecration of the temple, they came up with an interpretation which according to many legal scholars was very convoluted. They came up with an interpretation that supported the building of the temple. And as far as I could, I understood the position, the, the government was not supposed to consecrate the temple, the prime minister, but the prime minister managed to do that as well. So if someone can go to the court now and say he violated the judicial order, then the judiciary has to examine that. And, uh, I don't think the judiciary either has the courage to do that or may not ideologically also believe that this is all very wrong. May believe, some judges may believe that Hindu supremacy uh, is not a bad idea and perhaps a good idea. I think uh, maybe the witching hour is coming at 8.30. We could probably take one more question, Bob, and then... Okay. All right, one more question. Um, are there any Hindu factions or politicians that support a more liberal position with respect to Muslims? And if so, can they survive? Terrific question. Yes, there are. Many. Um, they will survive. But... Can they defeat Mr. Modi is the issue. And can they um, swing public opinion in their direction? Um, it doesn't seem that it may it will happen in 2024. But Mr. Modi is 74. He'll be 79 in 2029 at the time of the next election. And it remains to political scientists of India and political observers wholly unclear what will happen after 2029. Next five years, if he wins, are going to be very, very tough for India's liberals and very tough for India's minorities, liberal Hindus included, yeah. Um, if he wins big, it is probably, if he wins a two-third majority, it probably means a change in the constitution. And then once the changes like that have, have, have taken place, once an amendment is put through, then 
changing the, the, the again the constitution again will require two thirds of of parliament parliamentary support etc that will be very hard so uh, if he wins big um, Indian liberals and the liberalism of uh, the liberalism of the constitution and India's minorities are in very very great trouble. If he wins big, if he doesn't win big, a battle can still be fought. Okay. On that somber note, I think we have to stop. Thank you, Ashok, for a very very interesting, very detailed presentation about the situation in India. And we look forward to your wisdom about India in other media sources. You publish quite a bit in, in uh, media and so we'll keep an eye on that. And I wish to thank our audience also for raising very good questions. And I'll pass it over to Peter for the last words. Well, on behalf of the uh of the entire group that has organized this series. Uh, Dr. Barstein, we want to thank you for this presentation. It was enlightening. It was uh, fascinating. It was stimulating. And I enjoyed it. Uh, and I, I'm sure that the other folks did as well. Um, this concludes our series uh, for this year. Please fill out the evaluations when you get them. When we want your ideas, the ideas for these uh, lectures, the topics come from you. So if you don't make a suggestion, we're at a loss. Uh, and, and with that, uh, thank you all uh, for a successful series and uh, good night. Thank you. Do you think I can get these questions which were not asked? Can they, can they be sent to me or? Yep, I can do that. I've got them copied right here. I'll email them right yeah, to you. Yeah, all, all the questions that were, the questions were so good. If you can send them to me, it'll be wonderful. Yeah? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, um, uh, thank you in particular to the audience for very engaging, engaging uh, Q&A session. We're not a flyover state. Bye. Bye-bye now. <laughs>